All righties, if that's time again, it's our Thursday webinar. I'm Nat, Head of Community at Exceptional Individuals. And today we are going to be looking at the clumsy trope in TV. So what exactly is this? Well, when we look at like me, the media influences everything we do, think and see, even if we don't really like to admit it. So if you were to ask the average person, hey, do you know what Spraxer is? They'll probably say no. But if you say, do you know what clumsiness is? They're going to know. Now, me and you, hopefully we know that dyspraxia isn't just about clumsiness. There's a lot more to it. But when it comes to how things are portrayed in media, we like to show them black and white, one dimensional, easy stuff. The difficulty with that is it does change how people see you. Like it creates this kind of like bias and it creates a false representation. So today we are going to be looking at how is dyspraxia represented in media? Is it dyspraxia or is it just clumsiness? Is it just comedy and slapstick or is it potentially offensive? Uh, to give you a bit of my background, as well as being a neurodiversity specialist, I also have a degree in media production and I've studied film and theory for many, many years now. So I thought this was a perfect opportunity to bind two passions and put them together. Now, for those of you who have come quite a few times, we have actually done a dyspraxia in pop culture before. This is more of a continuation, whereas the other one was about where have we seen it, both positive and negative. This is more focusing on the trope uh, around clumsiness. And this actually goes back to, I think, about 1975, when the term uh, the cl clumsiness syndrome was first coined. So when we talk about dyspraxia, a lot of people say, isn't that the clumsy disease? Um, that's wrong on a few levels, but unfortunately, mud sticks. So they do join up. Looking at the comments, we've got Rachel says, I was tested and showed up as a yes on the pretest, but no in the actual test. However, also said that might benefit from another test and my ADHD crossing over into dyspraxia. That is interesting. And it kind of does matter like who you speak to. And if any of you came to last week where we talked about ADHD in different genders and sex, you'll see that even clinicians have a preconceived idea of what they believe they're looking for, even if it's not the most fair and equal. We've got, I've been assessed for currently ASC and ADHD this year. Stereotypes are a bane of our existence. And we are going to be like, today's probably going to uh, rattle your bones. And I want it to be a discussion, OK, because a lot of these things we cannot prove they were influenced by a dyspraxic individual. Maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you don't. So feel free to challenge me today because these are just some personal picks. But there's many, many more. I would argue that even if they weren't intentionally inspired with someone who struggles with coordination, um, such as someone with dyspraxia, if that is what people connect with and resonate with, it potentially could have damaging consequences. When you see someone who's a bit clumsy, no one thinks, I bet they're a hidden genius. I bet they're going to be great in the workforce. We think klutz, wobbly, dangerous, accident prone. So it does have an impact. So though we do everything under the sun at EI, today we are going to be specializing in dyspraxia. And I know that pretty much everyone here knows what dyspraxia is, but I think it's always good to go back to basics. So I am going to be defining it as well. Here's what we do. You've seen it before. I'm not going to hold on to it, but check out our website if you want to learn more about what exceptional individuals get up to in our spare time. So last week's webinar was on ADHD, the difference in X and Y and XX chromosomes. But actually, since doing the research, we discovered it's not really much about your biological sex. It's more about gender and those views that are put onto us. Maybe it's not too dissimilar to what we're doing today. So today is the clumsy child dyspraxia trope. And you will see this time and time again. I can only highlight the tip of the iceberg on some of the examples. And like I said, all these ones are different from the previous one we did on just general dyspraxia. So there are some I've missed out. So on here, do you have any of these dyspraxia traits? 
I mean, for me, mine have changed a lot over the years. My handwriting is really bad. And I know it might you might not agree with me, but I actually struggle with speech quite a lot, particularly at a younger age. I often say words like in the wrong order and it gets annoying. Um, but hopefully most of you are used to that by now. Well, Natalie says, my personal work, health and safety uh, procedures are extremely oppressive and do not support my safety and well-being robustly. So it seems a little OTT. I am more than a part-time wheelchair user now. I do have small periods of partial physical ability, but found out my neurodivergent conditions are impacting my mobility further. That's really interesting. I fall a lot. My balance is severely impaired at times, not for continuous long periods as yet, though. Does anyone speak sentences back to front? Thanks for sharing that. And uh, that's a bit of an ordeal. When I was younger, I was actually in a wheelchair and it was because it was I think it was mostly to do with my ASC, uh, to be fair, because I found the world a bit overbearing and I would just kind of like collapse. That is obviously no longer the case, but it's interesting how it can affect you at different parts in your life. But as to speak in sentence backwards, backwards, yeah, I do. Maybe not in a cartoony fashion, but like the odd words here or there. Okay, what we've got here, we've got a lot of people who have clumsiness, poor balance and fatigue, which is tiredness. Rachel says, I often mix up letters and words too. My iconic boons bean instead of bean spoon has been now said in jest a lot we've all got words like that i think it's like i say it all the time and my mates are always taking the mickey out of me but we that is something we're going to be looking at today when is it okay to take the mickey out of someone and when does it cross a line i don't think we're going to get an answer to that today it's kind of individual but it's interesting to bring up okay we also got this or information Okay, nice. So quick definition on what is dyspraxia. A developmental, that means you're either born with it or you had it at very early age, motor coordination disorder, motor, you know, movement, that is characterized by a significant delay in the acquisition of motor skills. So we all have to learn things from infant to adult, but for some of us, it takes us a bit longer. And by implement in the planning and executive um, execution of coordination motor skills. Well, oh, I don't like doing these like long ones. Like you can see, I struggle. <laughs> um, these can manifest in clumsiness, slowness, or inaccuracy of motor performance. So when we think, you know, is dyspraxia and clumsiness related? Yeah, they are, but it's only one of the key characteristics. But the thing here is, I'm sure a lot of you, particularly those of you who are maybe a bit older, would have definitely heard of the clumsy child syndrome. Uh, I know, Katie, you mentioned it a moment ago. Now, this was first coined in 1975, not that long ago, but an interesting time in history, because at 1975, I think most people had TVs. Like the media was definitely expanding at a rapid rate then. So when they kind of coined clumsy child syndrome, this would have been on TV. This would have been in the news. So that probably pay, plays a critical part in this. So the clumsy child syndrome described children of normal intelligence who had difficulties in coordination and interfered with academic performance or socialization. In other words, kids who are a bit like a, a bit of a klutz, falling over a bit and not great at talking to individuals. So this is like, a nice way of putting it. But obviously, as we will see, this definition is portrayed in media we see every day, but maybe not quite as uh, delicate. Laura says, I'd like to join an archery club, but I'm terrified I would be absolutely terrible at it. Don't worry, you know, archery is fun, um, as long as you just point it away from others. I'm awful. I went to, a few years back, I went to a wedding, right? And we had a party afterwards and we were playing rounders. I am so badly coordinated. I went to hit the bat right and I accidentally threw the, the, uh, the bat backwards. I threw it and it hit the, um, the maid's, um, the bride's uh, brother and his ear was like kind of off and bleeding. And I, was like, I felt well guilty. 
I've not been invited to a wedding since. Anyway, moving on from the definition of that, quick thing to all of you. What do you think, when you think of the word clumsy, what other words come to mind? So I just want to do a bit of a brain dump right now. All the things that just come to mind when you hear the word clumsy. Oh, Richard, how many of you are also accidentally ambidextrous, which means you can use both hands? I am, but not consistently. So like for like archery or for eating my food, I'll be left handed. But for most things, I'll be right. But you're right, it's a very common characteristic. So we've got accident prone, poor coordination, silly, stupid, cartoonish, off balance, neat. <laughs> And these are interesting. Why? Because these words aren't positive. So you, we, when we're watching these things, we might think these shows are just trying to be funny. They just want a cheap laugh. It's not really meant to be like taking a jab at us. But if other people relate, okay, you've got someone with poor coordination. Oh, okay, so they are silly, fumblish, cartoonish, stupid, poor, coordinate, poor coordination oh, you also have poor coordination and you have dyspraxia. You see how they kind of get linked together. So I am not trying to be the PC police here. I flipping love comedy, but I think it has to be acknowledged about some of the repercussions that it can have. So a quick thing, what exactly is pop culture? Well, pop culture is just modern popular culture transmitted via mass media. What this is, is a lot of the things I show you today, you may have not watched. That doesn't matter. Pop culture is what has influenced society. So let's say EastEnders. Do all of you watch it? Probably not all of you. But do you all know who Peggy Mitchell is or like Doc Cotton? I would say most of you do because these things are so ingrained. Or Game of Thrones. You may have never watched it, but you know what it is. And that is these things. So we have these ideas like Goofy. You might not really ever watch Mickey Mouse. I don't even know who does these days, but we all know that he's accident prone and he's a, a disaster waiting to happen. So that is what pop culture is. Let's get on to some examples. So the first one is, and I would be surprised if any of you have heard this, Pepsi Man. So this was actually in Japan only, I think, yet made in America. And it was this, they're kind of like a role model. And Mr. Pepsi Man, he uh, was really, 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 really accident prone. In every different commercial, he'd be falling off, breaking, bumping into things. And he was uh, seen as someone who looked like try hard. Remember, it was made in the US and then shown in Japan. And they might have not had that kind of Kind of connection, but we spread connections really easily now. Yes, Lawrence says an iconic video game too. I didn't think anyone would get that, so I didn't mention it. It was also a video game. Next one is film. So these are some films which I think are related to dyspraxia, influenced by dyspraxia, or might have had a negative impact on our wider community. Goonies. Who doesn't love the Goonies, eh? Flippin' love the Goonies. One of my favourite films. Now, the characters, we've got Mikey, we've got Chunk, we've got Mouth, we've got Data. I want to know, out of these lovely four, which ones do you think have the biggest characteristics of dyspraxia? If you haven't watched it, Sorry, but you should watch it right now. Like, leave this webinar. It is, it's really a great film. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I'm saying most of you have. So everyone who have voted has said Chunk. You're right. Chunk is characteristically dyspraxic. And he's a child. And this is where the trope comes from. We all know that you can have dyspraxia as an adult, but that's been a relatively new thing. Um, most times it's always connected with adolescence. That's why we're focusing on children today. But it absolutely can affect you in current age, as I can see in some of the comments. Oh, nice. What is the view on Laurel and Hardy, the Free Stro Stooges? Well, we are actually going to be going on a bit of um, slapstick. I'm not mentioning them today, but probably should have. But I'm going to be looking at Dick Van Dyke and the Dick Van Dyke show. It's interesting because... 
I don't know. I'd love to know other people's thoughts. Oh, Katie says, maybe suggestion that he ran out of energy and Pepsi can re-energize him. Maybe, but if he's Pepsi man, you'd like to think he's made out of Pepsi. I don't know how he works, but good shout. So Chunk is the one. <laughs> I love Chunk doing the truffle shuffle. So Chunk's clumsiness breaks the treasure map from its frame. What do you mean this time? What do you break this time, Chunk? And that's kind of interesting because, yes, it is a negative, but this negative unintentionally helped them solve something they wouldn't have been able to solve otherwise. But Chunk is still seen as a bit of a loser. Let's be honest, like he's the kind of the comic relief. And that is something you're going to be noticing. These individuals who do have coordination difficulties, and if I was to argue any of them were dyspraxic, I think Chunk would be high on the list. But he's also the most lovable and arguably the favourite character in The Goonies. So positive, negative, I don't know. You tell me. Next is for a controversial one, Jar Jar Binks from Star Wars, the prequels. Do you, like, you know what? I like Jar Jar. Anyone who doesn't like Jar Jar, what's wrong with you? He's a great character. However, I, though I'm older than the uh, trilogies, they were actually the first ones I ever watched. I missed out on Star Wars as a kid for some reason. So I kind of grew up with the prequels first, which maybe changed my view on it. But Jar Jar is 100% the comic relief character. He is an absolute mess. And he even self-diagnosed until he says, like, me so clumsy, you know, he, it's his thing. But what I'm not so sure about Jar Jar is they make it... He's a very two-dimensional character. He doesn't really add that much. Like this was this card here was from like a card and dice game age years ago. And he's literally called the clumsy outcast. And outcast on its own, clumsy on its own. But the fact they've joined those two together, they are saying very firmly, this is a negative characteristic. He's not clumsy but lovable. He is clumsy and an outcast. He is a pain in the butt. Let's be honest. Most of the world hates Jar Jar, and they hate Jar Jar, and Jar Jar's character was purely based near enough on being clumsy and a bit of a loner. I think, you know, he's problematic. I like Jar Jar for how he looks. I think he looks cool. But in terms of his original starting point, not that positive. Oh, Katie doesn't like Star Wars. No, I love Star Wars, but fair enough. <laughs> oh, that loves a bit of Jar Jar. Oh, Lawrence, unfortunately, he does not have a good portrayal. You're right. Never seen it. I don't agreed. Yeah, I think Jar Jar's not particularly aged very well. And he is an example of poor writing and how relying on a particular stereotype or trope uh, is not a great way to flesh out a character. Uh, the person who actually voiced Jar Jar, I think, suffered so much abuse and like bullying as a result of it because of the hate that was kind of pushed towards him. I think Jar Jar would have been hated for many reasons, but let's face it, it was his whole attitude. Well, Rachel says, I feel especially recently the clumsy idiot boy and or nerd character has spun around into quirky, clumsy lead girl, especially in teen shows, usually the romantic focus now, or that how it feels over the last few years. No, Rachel, you're right. And I think the kind of a clumsy, attractive girl is another newer trope, which is being shown all the time. I recently just finished unapologetically Never Have I Ever on Netflix. And the main character, Dar Davey, no, Darvey, is always shown as a bit of a klutz. Attractive, but a hot mess. Yeah, I thought you were talking about them. So quick one on Jar Jar. Let's say we're uh, all diagnostic professionals. Let's diagnose Jar Jar. Could Jar Jar be dyspraxic? Yeah, and no, I agree. Uh, as an intersectional person myself, I cannot get behind Star Trek fully as they frequently demean females, obviously stereotypes and other intersectional communities. Okay, fair enough. Princess Leia in her slave costume wasn't the most progressive thing in the world. It comes difficult because, like, 
intent i don't often believe it's someone's intentionals but all the, a lot of these things are unconscious we do them because it is what we've grown up knowing but by doing that and pushing it to a wider audience we are perpetuating this myth of the like stubborn woman or like the aggressive person of color or the clumsy and idiot dyspraxic you know all these kind of things which are true we are pushing it deeper Okay, nice. So we say, so Jar Jar, clumsiness. Yeah, he is very, very clumsy. Thought and memory. Oh, yeah. Perception of sense, emotion and behavior. Yeah, I actually think he's got quite a bit of empathy, Jar Jar. Um, we never see him again. Have any of you heard the rumor that he's actually a Sith Lord? I like that one. Speech and language. I mean, he's not English, so his, his English is going to be a bit dodge, but I think he does his best. So here's another quick question to you. Should every portrayal of a person in the media who is clumsy be taken as a portrayal of dyspraxia? So two answers to choose from here. Yeah, the more exposure, the better. Or no, it should be named in the media. And at the moment, we've got most people saying it should be named. And while I do agree with you, the fact is people aren't naming it. Let's face it. We've got, what, someone from Doctor Who... There aren't many people who are named as dyspraxic in media. So people have to look other in other ways. It comes down to, you know, when we look at like the LGBT community and how they've been portrayed in media, for many years, you weren't allowed to publicly talk about it, but directors and actors would kind of like slip in little nuggets. Um, now they did that as a way of giving a nod to those that they're not allowed to nod to. I don't think the same thing is done with dyspraxia because it's not like a subtle, like, you know, it, it's definitely done at the expense of people who are clumsier. Lorna says dyspraxia is one of those conditions that isn't as well known as dyslexia. You are completely right. Yet statistically, it's about as like common. It's interesting. We've got Rachel says that's fair. Whereas I enjoy watching them and they're pointing out that issue. Maybe I am gluttony of things that I can agree with. Sorry, I'm bad at reading, but I agree with you. It is unknown to so many people which highlights how dyspraxia are different and weird or sometimes negative. I'm glad you're all like we're joining in today because I think this is useful. Are we preaching to the converted? Maybe, but this is going on YouTube after, so like and subscribe. Next one is Police Academy. So this is a whole series of film. And this is one of the first cases where it really is used for comic effect. So Douglas, um, who is this cadet, he is always inflicting danger to others and inflicting like harm. But as you can see in this little gif, he is oblivious. Like he isn't really aware of his surroundings. He doesn't have great depth perception. And I would say in this a case that maybe it was influenced by um, a dyspraxic tendency or a quality that the writer kind of witnessed. I'm not always convinced that they knew they were emulating certain dyspraxic traits because, as we said, it's not that well known. But either way, it is. You know, but is this different from Laura and Hardy? I would say so because this is more kind of plot driven. But again, love to know your thoughts. Now for Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Oh, quick one. Katie says, what about Mr. Bump? Uh, Mr. Clumsy, Mr. Forgetful, Little Miss Scatterbrain? Completely. I mentioned him in the last one. That's why I didn't do it, but you're completely right. Your GP has actually researched this Braxia, Rachel. That's cool. Anyway, back to Mr. Indy. I think there's a new Indy coming out soon. Can't wait. So Elsa, who arguably a bit evil, loses balance and drops a grail and clumsily knocks over the grail into a, uh, like a cavern, a uh, crevice. So this woman, she is continuously being clumsy. Now, you could argue there's a couple of tropes coming here. You've got the classic trope of, hold on to me, I'll save you, or the macho man saving the woman, or the bad person getting their comeuppance, or someone being kind of like poor at coordination. So there's a few things going on here. Now, if she was just a one-off like mistake, I wouldn't have put that in here. But for me, dyspraxia is something which is like kind of continuous. It's not an accident. It's something which happens before a reason because of how you process movement and coordination. 
So that, for me, is when I think, if it's just a one-off accident, no, we all drop things. But because this was like a re- like repeated events, and typically the more stress someone gets with dyspraxia, or any neurodivergence for that matter, the prevalence of their traits emerging kind of like start to really speed up. So my spelling as a dyslexic, yeah, it's not all right. It's all right these days. But when I'm stressed, it gets worse. With autism, you know, it can be harder to socialize. But when you're stressed, it can be even harder to socialize. So this is why I put it in here. Oh, we got Chuckle Brothers. Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't love the Chuckle Brothers? Chuckle Vision. <laughs> Eddie the Eagle. I think this is a relatively new film. Um, so Eddie, was well, this was based on a real person and he's incredibly accident prone. Now, this is kind of an interesting one because it was based on a real person, but obviously they exaggerated it because if you do things realistically, they're a bit boring. But because this is based on a real person, maybe people viewing this might assume this is an accurate portrayal of someone who has a dyspraxia i don't know if he's dyspraxic if diagnosed but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that possibly now the real life eddie was nicknamed mr magoo i don't know if any of you have heard of magoo but he was kind of a really old maybe a bit senile kind of like visually impaired person who would bump into things and you might think well that's to do with a visual impairment was eddie visually impaired i think he had glasses but i don't think so particularly But it's interesting because we often kind of join things together. Oh, if you can't, if you're a bit clumsy, should have gone to spec savers, which, you know, is just a bit offensive. Or people who um, struggle with contrast and reading, and it's about how the brain processes it, people assume it's a visual problem when it's not. So sometimes we can mix things together due to lack of understanding. Yes, Rachel says most anime love interests We are going to be talking a bit about anime. You're right. Let's face it. Females in anime. uh, (laughs) I love anime, but it's not the most empowering. There's also a connection to iron syndrome. Lorna, you're completely right. And I wanted to say that one, but I had a bit of a mind blank. Yeah. So uh, iris syndrome is about like contrast and is highly related to dyslexia. But typically those individuals get misdiagnosed with poor eyes. So, yeah, good shout there. Arthur Christmas. What a nice little Christmas film, if any of you watched it. Not the best, but a nice bit of lighthearted fun. So Arthur, um, I believe, is he the son of Santa or like a grandchild? You tell me. He is consistently tripping over things and he's all over a bit of a mess. Now, he is wearing oversized slippers, but I think that he's kind of naturally that way anyway. And he's quite a young individual. It works for me. Now, with this thing, they do kind of go on a journey. Whereas this individual had a difficulty. They've acknowledged the difficulty. They went for a thing. And now they no longer have that difficulty. And sometimes that gives other people the view that those with disabilities or challenges can be fixed. And it is a journey. When we know that though you can overcome some of the challenges and you can learn to manage them, you will have dyspraxia for life. So I would like to see some films show that you still have the difficulty, but maybe the way you've come to accept it has been different rather than having to always fix it at the end. Thanks for all the comments, everyone. I'm I'm loving them. Now, here's a quick question to you. When we're showing these characteristics in the media, is it comic relief, pure, simply, you know, no issues, What is it ableism? Now, if you've not heard of ableism before, it's a set of beliefs or practices that devalue and discriminate against people with physical, intellectual, or psychiatric disabilities. I'm not sure on this one. It is is challenging because I love comedy. I actually quite like dark comedy. I love things like South Park, which are quite brutal. But they are, it it is ableism, isn't it? You are kind of re-alliterating what people already think to be true, that those who are able are more superior. They're more likely to find love. They're more likely to be the hero. They're less likely to be the person we laugh at at the expense of others. So maybe I would probably say so. 
We've got, yes, some growth would be nice instead of I have this. So that's no improvement, only pain. Absolutely. Like Goofy, we've not seen any development in him. He's got a child, Max, but who's the mum? You know, what is with Disney and like killing off parents? We've got uh, Lauren says, unfortunately, the being fixed journey is really common portrayal of disabilities. You see it a lot, especially in the case of physical disabilities, such as amputations or needing a wheelchair. Yeah, that is true. Like, oh, they can walk. It's a miracle. No, just. That's not a good like kind of conclusion, but I agree with you on that. Moving on to TV. So what is the old telly showing us? This one, again, not everyone might have seen it, but in Angel, which is a like post Buffy the Vampire series, you've got Wesley and he's always kind of like throwing axes or kind of a, he's a bit of a, a bit of a klutz. Now, maybe he does it because he's nervous around women, uh, but it, maybe he, it's not really related to nerv nervousness. I'm not sure how I feel on this one. I haven't watched Angel. I've only watched Buffy, but apparently he was more accident-y uh, in the later series. So yeah, let's put a no for that one. Oh, we've also got Rich says, I like to, I, I thought you don't like, I break everything, but at work I break some things something learn when I broke it and I adjust that for next time to reduce the risk. Sometimes I still break it and sometimes I won't, but at least some, oh, I see. So there is a journey and a progression, but ultimately it is. Now we spoke about some of the old fashioned comedy like uh, Laurel and Hardy um, and also Dick for Dick Van Dyke show. You know, he's still going. I think, what is he like 93 now or 98? Like, he's cracking on, but he's still still a funny guy. Now here, he's just like always falling over things, you know, kind of get hit in the face by a racket, you know, tripping over things, breaking things. These are very, very common characteristics of dyspraxia. But we find it funny. It's like watching you being framed or like kind of YouTube fail clips on YouTube. But I would game the difference for me is that when you watch fail clips, typically it's a like one off fail where this here, Dick is just being himself. He is just walking in and he's tripping up and he probably has another accident in a few minutes time. So yes, it is used to make a laugh, but I would also say that this is probably a portrayal in if it was in the real world of dyspraxia. We've got, it'd be so nice to see a character figure out what's wrong and how they adjust their lives how they struggle and how they achieve, etc. Not just, oh, I'm fixed by love or fixed by a doctor, except. Yeah, that love seemed to fix a lot of things in the films. So quick question to all of you. How do you think dyspraxia should be shown in the media? Let's say we get to actually develop something how we really want it to be. Where would we begin? Okay, Lauren says, even in Buffy, Wesley was often portrayed as being slower to understand what has been discussed in a group to repeat himself in a conversational, from what I recall. Thanks. Now, that's interesting. And as we know with dyspraxia, it doesn't impact intelligence, but it can mean you're slower to process and get that information out. But the audience doesn't know that. They just think you're slow because you don't know the answer. I could do like, so many different talks on... Uh, the portrayal of stupidity in media, which is damaging. Okay, what we got here, we got identify what is it actually is and explain how it affects people and how it isn't their fault. Nice. Dyspraxia is part of them, not dyspraxia is them, not dyspraxia is the main focus. Some funny moments would be nice and relatable, but so but also show them how it can be serious on occasions. Do you know what? I, I mentioned this in the last one we did, but I think um, Bridget Ch Jones is quite a good example. Her kind of accident proneness is funny, but she also has some real serious moments and we do see character development. We've got a character can explain that they are dyspraxic if they do some think clumsy and another person doesn't know why. Yeah, I think just like... I'm not, I don't want to like rinse all the comedy out of everything, but I do think that if you make the joke, get your laugh, but then if you can explain 
like just give it a bit more context it stops that kind of view being taken seriously because i don't think anyone has anything against jokes but it's when the jokes are perceived as fact and real by other people who don't really get it or miss certain context and then kind of carry that view forward i think that's when it becomes particularly damaging we got as a condition which is manageable and not as negative as not as a negative trait of someone uh we're going to be talking about it being seen as a pure trait of negativity in a moment. Version age is not just children, not connected to a funny trope, but instead a quirk which makes people interesting, not as a negative, absolutely. Dyspra what have we got here? We've got dyspraxia should be outright named if that's intended. It should be part of the character's identity, but not that only trait. Nice, thanks everyone. We've got a nice empathizing, brilliant. Oh God, you yeah, so much great comments today. I wish I could read them out more, but uh, just for time. Fraser, I used to love watching Fraser as a kid. Every day before school, I'd watch one episode of Friends and one episode of Fraser. And if I'm feeling lucky, an episode of Everyone Loves Raymond. But Niall Crane, who is the brother of Fraser, was, I would say, a very good example of dyspraxia. But also maybe an example of autism, maybe he had a mixture of both because he was socially awkward. He was painted as the kind of odd genius, but also a bit awkward. And his dad was a bit of a jock, really good at sports. And he's like, this isn't my son. So they'd always make jokes about how they don't quite align or they don't really gel as a family. Niles is so uncoordinated, he once hit himself in the face with a coiny toss. So it's just a simple coin toss in the face. And that's because he wasn't able to like distance, like that depth perception wasn't there. Also in the final season, Daphne, his then to be wife, gently tosses a banana, which causes him to dramatically fall and knock a gun, causing it to misfire. I do think normally clumsiness is shown as a domino effect, how one thing impacts another, which impacts another. So it's kind of like an ongoing thing. Okay, Lawrence says, out of curiosity, are the people with dyspraxia introverted? I would say typically yes, if I was to take a guess or from what I view, but not solely no, because there's many people who aren't introverted. But I also think that you can be introverted and extroverted depending on the circumstances and situations. Um, so someone who's around their friends, extroverted, someone in the situation where they believe might be judged due to the media that you think the people have consumed that have negative ideas. Yes, you definitely could be. So another question, is it OK to retrospectively assign characteristics to characters? What do I mean by this? Let's say a lot of these uh, writers who did these characters did not intend for us to say, I think they have dyspraxia. But is it OK to say, ah, actually, I think they do? Like Lauren Hardy, like, for instance, can we go back in time? An example of this is Mr. Dumbledore. So he is officially gay now. However, he was not gay in the books. J.K. Rowland decided retrospectively to make him gay. And I believe there is now signs in the Fantastic Beasts films. It's a complicated one, isn't it? Because yes, representation's great, times have changed. But if you really, or why didn't you include that in the original material? So interesting. So at the moment we've got, yes, if the creator confirms it. I'm still, I'm torn on that, I am torn, but I guess it's better than nothing. It does not bother me, nice. So I'd say retroactive is completely fine, depending on why they did it. Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, well, let's, well I'll remind you, yeah, if they confirmed it. I'll, I'll lead with you on that. I'm still not kind of convinced. I know that's kind of what I'm doing today, but for a lot of these conditions, there just isn't the representation. And if you can't draw comparisons between someone, you know, some of your biggest role models we might relate to, even if it's not officially confirmed, I guess I'm okay with that, but each to their own. Books, and I've got a few more. I've got books, some anime and video games to go, I believe. So from books, we've got Bella from Twilight. Is she a bit klutzy in the movies? Absolutely. But in the books, way, way more. I would argue, though, in a book, you have more, more space to develop, flesh a character out. So maybe it's not as like detrimental. 
So Bella is always being pointed and, dis and being discussed as her klutzy tendencies. And I guess this goes back to what we mentioned previously. There is a turn. Before it was always done as the kind of dim-witted guy who's a lovable fool. And now it's more to the attractive female who is always tripping over her own self. So there definitely has been a change. Um, interestingly, though, Bella's uh, tendencies do impact the plot. So people are so focused on her always bumping herself that when she has all like bite marks and bruises from vampires like sucking on her neck, um, no one really notices. Uh, so I think it's quite a nice, a, a subtle way to kind of link the two together. You know, the whole thing about uh, a smoke gun, like in films, everything is included for a reason. So though it would be nice to just have someone who is dyspraxic just for the sake of it being dyspraxic with no kind of relation to any further story, realistically due to time constraints, that's never going to be a thing. But I think you can do it more sensitively. Oh, Rachel, Rachel, you're definitely into your pop culture, I can tell. There's Bella in the books, seems to be very mood flippant, et cetera. And I always thought she must have some neurodiversity, et cetera. Yeah, I think you're very right on that. Kirsten Stewart, so in the film, didn't have that emotional reach though, unfortunately. <laughs> though I did like her in it. Harry Potter, Harry Potter is a great one. Mr. Neville Longbottom, in the early books, definitely, he was always a bit clumsy. In the later books, not so much. But the main reason for Neville's clumsiness was his constant nervousness. So you talk about introverted, extroverted. Neville would have been introverted. And that anxiety led to his wobbliness. So there are examples that though they show the similar traits of dyspraxia, because the character has been a bit more fleshed out and we can understand how they got to that outcome, we can probably put together that, no, maybe I don't think Neville is because we know more about the character. So a lot of the times it's because we do not know enough about the character. Animation. What classic animated films show some great examples? Futurama. I love Futurama. Amy Wong. Amy, again, have you noticed the trend? All things that were made since like mid 2000s tend to show an attractive female who's always falling over herself. But prior to that, it was typically a lovable male. So Amy is described as the klutz from Mars. She's from Mars, by the way. And Amy screams every time she falls. So it's kind of like a continuous like running gag. Is this as good or bad? I don't know, because, you know, people love Amy. And I think it kind of it gives the conventional attractive character a bit more depth they're not just attractive there's also other elements to them is that i mean definitely you know being clumsy and attractive you know you would like to have a bit more depth but i guess they are starting to add more avenues yes case is homer simpson completely and i'm glad you mentioned homer simpson so matt graining and david x or whoever else made Futurama, decided to make Amy the klutz rather than the male. Because in The Simpsons, it's Bar, it's Homer, it's always the males who are the comic relief. And they thought, what if we jazz it up a bit and make the female the kind of newer version of that? Now, I don't think they stuck to it because Amy takes a bit of a backseat in the series, but it is interesting. And it was very purposefully done to make it a female rather than a male. Rachel says Amy's an odd one because I think they wanted airhead vibes and then it kind of shifted. Yeah, they they had something which was kind of maybe a bit progressive and then they kind of went back on it and made her like the ditzy blonde, even though she's not blonde. Amy comes across as a less intelligent character, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I do think they kind of changed as they went along because remember they... um. They made her more accident prone as more of an experiment, to be fair, in contrast to the males in their other series, The Simpsons. We've got Disney's Hercules. Hercules is a right mess, mainly because he's super strong and half God, but he is still showing a lot of the characteristics. But more so than just in the movie, if any of you watch the old Disney cartoon series, which focuses on Hercules as a teenager, 
this is kind of like one of the main themes that runs in everything, how clumsiness, adolescence, and in many ways, I think it's quite, it represents a lot how teenagers feel, because in our, in reality, we've just bumped into someone, it's not a big deal, but in our heads, it feels really like 10 times the amount of embarrassment. So it, for me, I thought it's quite a good way of showing how something that you can't help, something you was born with can make you feel ostracized and alone. And yes, he does overcome this, but Hercules, even as an adult, is still a bit clumsy, to be honest, but he's been able to use his weakness as his strength. So I quite like Hercules as an example. Now here's a few ones. Out of these characters, who do you think fits the best mold for a potential dyspraxic. Are we talking about George, George, George of the jungle? Watch out for that tree. Or Marshall from Paw Patrol? I'll confess I've not seen Paw Patrol, but it looks like a cracking show. Daphne from Scooby-Doo or Clumsy Smurf? Now I can see all you said Clumsy Smurf, right? It's in the name, but he is completely one dimensional. I think they all are, to be honest. They all have their views. I think Daphne's quite a good good one. But again, attractive female who's a bit of a mess. But we kind of overlook that. And that isn't the characteristic she is defined for because she has another element to herself where when it comes to males, that is all they're known for. Are any of the X-Men pot potentially dyspraxic? That is a really good question. I think, yes, I would say... I'd like to know who you thought. Katie Pride. Okay, on to anime now. And oh, we are getting close to time, so I'll speed up a little bit. Pokemon. Um, in a lot of anime, they love going over the top. You know, embarrassment, awkwardness, mishaps is a really big theme. Ash in the early series, I think, is really accident prone. You know, he breaks Misty's bike, he's always bumping himself, falling over. And <laughs> But they do flesh him out a bit more. So I don't think it's a necessarily a bad case. Uh, however, when it comes to how they put it on different Pokemon, it's not the best. I'll move on from that one because it's kind of a bit like jarring to the eyes. Comics. We've got the Archie comics. I've not read Archie, but I have seen all of Riverdale, uh, to my sins. And Archie in the, in the series is seen as kind of a cool kid, but in the comic books is really clumsy. He's always falling off. But why do I like this example? I like this example because it is mentioned that his whole family is a bit clumsy. And as we know, dyspraxia is hereditary, meaning that it runs in the family. So again, if it was just one off trait, I don't think we could say. But because we know it runs through the family, it means it's genetic. And that means a higher likelihood. So yeah, good on you, Mr. Archie. I would also say Jughead is a little bit as well. Then we've got The Flash. So one of you mentioned Marvel, what about The Flash? I know it's DC. So Jay Garrick, um, this is his origin story. And I have been told by a reliable source, there's many, many origins. He was like hit by lightning. So this is just one way he became The Flash. Uh, he knocked over some chemicals and they gave him super speed. So had it have not been for his clumsiness, he wouldn't have got the strength. And this is kind of a thing we're seeing more and more in media now, how people with disabilities are being shown as superheroes. I think maybe that's going to one stream to the other and again isn't positive. I don't know enough about this character to know if this was a one-off occurrence or if he was always breaking and moving things. But it's quite interesting to see that someone who ended up with super agility, ridiculous superhuman coordination, originally got that skill by being someone who did quite a careless act. So interesting. Yeah, over the top. Brilliant. Then we've got some music. Um, a bit tongue in cheek, but um, Erica Joe, who's a country music star, does this song called I Break Things. And uh, I actually think this was inspired by real life dyspraxia. I encourage you to watch it. It's, uh, it's a bit of a cheesy song, but she just talks about how she's always bumping in, breaking things. It's a bit of a metaphor for the heart, but it's also very physical as well. Uh, so yeah, I think this might be a real one. Games? All right, games. How can we miss games out? Luigi, Mario's brother, his favourite brother. <laughs> so Luigi displays clumsiness. 
And this is the great example because it's you can compare him to his brother Mario. In Super Smash Bros, he when he like kind of like fights, he lands on his head. But Mario, on the other hand, does not land on his head. So you've got like a direct comparison there. Another thing which is quite interesting is Luigi, one of his in a lot of games, like he has slightly different abilities to Mario. He can jump higher than Mario. That's his like USP. However, Mario's got better coordination. I think this is also kind of represented in Mario Karts as well. So what I like about this, at least for an example, is yes, he has challenges, but he's better in other areas. And the same with Mario. So they both got their strengths and weaknesses. And that's quite a good thing about video games. It shows you that there's not one character which you should pick every time, depending on the needs or the circumstances, someone else might be potentially a better, a better touch for it. The Sims, this is about the personality. Oh yes, we've got Sonic X, DuckTales. Oh, nice, some really good ones. The Sims is great. So from Sims, I want to say three to Sims four, they gave clumsy as an actual trait. Is this a good or a bad thing? I mean, it's not part of your personality, so maybe not. But simply, Sims will fall over if they get proposing. They'll drop the ring. They're all over the place. If anything, but it is done as a negative as well. Like allergic to fur, bold, maybe not cat lover, erratic. So a lot of these are a mixture between positive and negative. And if I was to take a guess, I'd say that when they created this, they meant this to be as more of a, a negative. If you were to create the ultimate Sim who can become like mayor of Simsville, you probably wouldn't pick the clumsy trait on purpose. And if you don't train your kid well enough as a child, when it grows up, it's more likely to develop the clumsy trait. Michael McIntyre, interesting. So yeah, we've reached the end now, but anyone I've missed, and I can see you've put some in the comments already, but keep them coming. Any other characters that you've seen in the media of any sorts, which you believe show characteristics of dyspraxia, whether good or bad. So Michael McIntyre, yeah, he's always wobbling his head. Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, Sonic from Sonic X, got DuckTales, Count Dracula, Big Bird from the original Sesame Street, the Count on Sesame Street, really good, great examples. There are so, so, so many. We aren't at a stage where we can do a webinar where we can actually talk about real life examples or characters that were based on it. But we are at a stage where we can say that if we describe dyspraxia purely as a clumsy condition, then these are the tones, the views, the thoughts that other people are going to automatically put in our head. At Exceptional Individuals, we're really passionate about not just teaching um, other individuals to accept neurodivergence, but also people who are neurodivergent to better explain what it means for them. Otherwise, we're just kind of um, adding fuel to the fire and people are only seeing one side of a very complex diagnosis, which has just as many strengths as it does challenges, and they're not always consistent. We've got the character in Jojo Rabbit. Yes, the boy, absolutely. And Doctor Who. I think Doctor Who might be as well, but also the um, his or oh, her companion, Sinclair, he is. Honestly, I didn't realise that was so many. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for that. One thing I will say, and I, I do this every time because it's what we do as a main company. If any of you are in employment currently and you think, you know what, I have dyspraxia, I would like some support. We can get you some support. It's free for anyone in the UK, pretty much. And you can get different training and equipment. And what I think is probably the most beneficial training for your organization, help people understand that there's more than one dimension to uh, dyspraxia. And there's things that can actually be beneficial to an organization rather than just things that we should avoid. Yes, Lauren says, Ryan, Ryan's click, nice. The Child in the Snowman, Sound of Music, wow, really good one. So any last questions before we wrap up today and I'll let you go enjoy the surprisingly good weather considering the storm warnings we've had in the UK at the moment. I think, yeah, well, I'm going to say, I'm going to uh, move past this, but any other questions, get in contact because I appreciate I've taken up enough of your time. But if any of you are free next Thursday, because we do these every Thursday, we're doing the Competitive Dyslexic Entrepreneur. So basically, we've been told that 40% of millionaires have dyslexia. 
we've been told that people with dyspraxia like Steve Jobs, um, uh, Richard Branston, a load of others have achieved enormous successes due to their out-of-box thinking. So we're going to be breaking down what makes a dyslexic entrepreneur so good at what they do compared to your regular run-of-the-mill CEO. Why are people more likely to quit their job and start their own business if dyslexic? So do join us for that. That's on the 25th. And if you want to stay in touch, you know, keep this community going. We actually have a Facebook group just for dyspraxia, where we share opportunities, share discussion, best practice. So feel free to research that, look it up. Um, just type in, I think, dyspraxia opportunities on Facebook and you'll find it. And last but certainly not least, here's our details. Feel free to pick up the old dog and bone if you want to get in contact. And uh, thank you so much for today, everyone. Uh, your comments are lovely and you've been such a great audience to interact with and gave me so many new ideas for hopefully a future one. So uh, thanks so much. Wow, that was a lot. Oh, and they're still coming in. So perfect. <laughs> All right, everyone, have a lovely, lovely Thursday. I love seeing you all every week and hopefully see you at the next one. But uh, thanks again.